Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, and welcome to the next episode of Decoding AQ. I have Beth Miller, who's joining us from Atlanta in the US. And she's a talent manager advisor at Executive Velocity, where she's been for quite some time. And welcome. Well, thank you, Ross. I've been looking forward to our conversation today. Great stuff. So um, we had a, a little moment to have a, a bit of a conversation beforehand. And I'm interested just to um, take your journey. You mentioned Vistage, that you've been uh, involved with them for some time. And uh, you've been at executive velocity is it 14 years yeah 14. so i imagine seeing lots of different experiences <laughs> lots of talks lots of lots of things with different companies and i'll be really excited to get get into there but what what led you in the first place to chair and be involved in uh, vistage what was the background for that well um my husband and i were running a technology consulting firm back in the late 90s. Uh, we made Inc. 500, fastest growing company. Um, ran it, ran it to, until 2002 and sold it. And we both found ourselves unemployed, um, <laughs> but uh, took some time off. We were, we're big travelers, so clearly right now is a challenge for us. And I was doing a lot of volunteer work and I still do, but it wasn't feeding me the way running a business did. So I, I started networking and um, met with a, a friend who had been a Vistage member for many years and spoke very highly of it. So back in 2005, I um, became a Vistage chair and I, I found my passion. And that was working with small to mid-sized companies, privately held, and helping their leaders get to that next level through coaching and training. And um, I, it, just, it just went from there. I set up Executive Velocity and started bringing on uh, clients as well as working with, with Vistage up until last year when I stepped away from, from Vistage. I think it's a really, you know, unique space and skill that, you know, often these small businesses, owner managed, owner run, how many of them are actually trained and supported to have that role? You know, they're, they're often good at something and then it snowballed, they start employing people and it surrounds themselves and then the complexities come. Mm -hmm. And I, I know this from experience. I, I ran a, a brand and marketing agency for nearly 18 years and I sold it in 2017 and just a roller coaster, you know, <laughs> of right. everything, you know, highs, lows, dealing with every aspect beyond my training, you know, right. be that finance or HR when I was mm -hmm. a designer, you know, and you yeah. kind of learn, learn on the, on the job, but mm -hmm. reaching out to coaches, reaching out to these networks for me was a, was a breakthrough in terms of my own development and the company development. So I guess that, that passion for you of connection of having done it yourselves within a right. tech business uh, with your husband and then being able to connect with others. It was a unique, unique mix. Yeah. We, you know, look back at all the mistakes that I made that, um, you know, I would run across with other business owners. And so it, you know, I could empathize with them as we were having these conversations and I could share with them some of the things that I learned, but then as a, as a um, group, a Vistage group, then, then you get peer advice as well, yep. which, which, you know, is invaluable. It, it is. I think this, um, you know, I came across a few years ago, this uh, either swarm or hive coaching and mentoring, where mm -hmm. instead of, it's a bit like a combination of uh, peer group uh, learning to actually having multiple in effect coaches or people coaching an individual at the same time in the same yeah. environment and is yeah. super powerful. Yeah. I, um, I have done, an, I don't, don't call it the swarm or, yeah. or hive, but um, group coaching where, yeah. where I'll go into organizations where they may have a group of high potentials mm -hmm. and their, their peers 
and it, it will be a blend of kind of that peer work as well as individual coaching. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very powerful. It is. Um, when you mentioned before about your big travelers and that's a challenge for you right now, something sprung into my mind of a talk a few years ago that really inspired me. And it was a chap who was creating a movement around micro adventures and mini adventures. Ooh, okay. And the concept was um, it was within a certain time and span of where you live how mm -hmm. you can make those areas the, the everyday a mini adventure. So for example, he talked about going to visit his uh, parents mm -hmm. and he's got his own family and young children. And normally they jump in the car, you know, go 40 minutes down the road and spend time with the parents. And they decided to change that into an adventure where they went on a hike uh, they camped halfway and they got there the next day. So it yeah. was like this mini adventure to do something different right. when, um, and I, I, it just sprung to my mind of, you know, how could we treat this challenge of, of lockdown and distancing and all of these things as mini adventures rather than, oh, I can't travel. How would I do things slightly differently that might feed uh, that need inside uh us? And I think, I think that's a, a great concept. Um, for me personally, I have an 87 year old mother who's living with us. So, you know, that otherwise, that challenge. Be, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So one of the aspects that uh, I understand you have helped organizations and work on is this challenge of succession. Yes. And I, I want to understand the, uh, the scope of succession, you know, because succession can mean many things to different people. Listen, yes. right? It could be succession of a person, of a leader. Mm -hmm. It could be succession in terms of a product line or propositions, you know, that we're having to now succeed what may have given us value yesterday right. and reimagining our businesses is a form of succession, uh, mm -hmm. maybe a, a, a different uh, parallel to think about the differences between product succession and maybe even individuals in the traditional sense. Right. Tell us your, you know, your experience of succession planning, some of the, the highs and lows of that would be great. Yeah. Uh, so because I work with mostly small to mid-sized companies, generally mm -hmm. 300 employees or less, um, one of the biggest roadblocks I see in smaller companies is uh, the founder owner being in fear of making him or herself replaceable because they, they don't have a vision for what they will do afterwards. They, they have spent their entire life or a big portion of their lives building what I call their baby. And, and that Fear is one of the things that, that I often end up spending a lot of time with, with the owner on first, because if, if they're not fully committed to it, doing a, an organizational succession plan, which means you know, looking at the entire organization and figuring out what the key positions are and making sure that you have people that are being developed to take the those key positions when when they are um, you know empty uh, then then you you can't do it unless you've got the commitment of of that CEO founder and so that's that's the biggest roadblock it is that um, you know that fear and vision what do you think underpins that is it the fact that you know from my own experience you know, wanting to be able to contribute and feel like I'm having a valuable contribution. Mm -hmm. um, that part of my challenge that going through that succession of fear, because I, I put in an MD and for 18 months before I sold it was completely, you know, hands off. It was a self-managing business. Yeah. And that kind of transition of the fears of, well, uh, I had a vision for what next, <laughs> but right. I guess many don't have that right. vision and it's a balance of being able to let go and be excited about what next. How do you, how do you overcome yeah. that? Yeah. So um, one of the things that I find um, from time to time is a um, CEO founder either identifies somebody internally that um, 
can be their successor and starts mm -hmm. developing them and preparing them for um, their position. But they have a, a real challenge in letting go and stepping in when they really shouldn't be stepping in. And oftentimes what happens is that individual starts getting frustrated. And there are times when they, they just decide, you know what, I, I got to go. I can't, I can't get what, get what it needs to be done with this individual continue to come in, come in and, and sticking their fingers in the pie. Yep. Yeah. I guess it needs such a, an adaption and change of their thinking, of their behavior, of everything that they've learned to be successful so far. They have to reimagine themselves um, and the way they behave, what they get involved in and all of those things. Yeah. One of the and principles we talk about is unlearning. So that ability to unlearn stuff, they've got to go through a lot of that unlearn and then build a new habit. Uh, one, one of the important things is that they have a, a clear understanding of success metrics and some sort of um, dashboard that they can, they can view from afar that might alert them to, to some issues. That, that then they have a conversation with that president CEO because they've at least got, they're not there day in, day out, but they, they at least have um, visibility to those, those key metrics that would show them that the, the company is healthy and, and moving forward. What are some of the challenges that the person that is then taking on that, uh, you know, challenge face. Um, what what uh, what advice could you give them if they're the person almost being given the baton, uh, right. or maybe half, or it's taken back every now and again? How do they deal with it? Well, um, first of all, they, if it's an internal promotion, they're going to be dealing with um, people that used to be their peers that are now reporting to them. So it's, you know, how do you manage that relationship to uh, make sure that it's, it's a healthy one and that the, those individuals that are reporting to, to the, the new president, CEO, um, understand that the, the role is, has changed and um, that there's going to be clear accountability and, and all of that. So, so that's from a downward uh, stream. Upwards, it's creating a um, working norms with the the current owner. You know what 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 are those things that I can't do? It's not what are the things I can do, but what are those things that I will have to come to you? Yeah. So clear boundaries. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And is there a in your experience of you know helping loads of different organizations through that process an average timeline that it takes you know what would be an expectation if i was um you know somebody who the ceo's just approached me told me that they're thinking of moving on uh, would i like to take it on what would be a you know there's the of course desired what they think they might want. And then there's a reality of how long it takes. What have you seen in some of those timelines? So it, it really depends. Um, it depends on what are the, the gaps that that individual has that need to be developed. Mm -hmm. And, and those things um, generally are tied to core competencies, um, knowledge and skills. So what, a, so you've, you've got to do a really good assessment on that person and get a, a development plan in place. Um, and obviously that development plan in, includes a timeline. I generally like to, to chunk it down into six months increments. Okay, mm -hmm. in the next six months, this is, this is what, what needs, um, what information development needs to happen for that person. Um, and you, you obviously back into it. If, if somebody has decided they wanna retire in three years well, that gives you a longer 
timeline, right? Um, and if they, the, the reverse is if they want to retire in a quicker amount of time, that could be a problem. That person may not be ready. So, you know, you've, you've got to be looking, succession planning is not like exit planning. Succession planning is an ongoing process. It's integrated into your business planning process. It's something that should happen on, on an annual basis. You should be looking and evaluating your talent pool, identifying those potentials, and you know, creating development plans for them so that when you get to the point where you have decided, okay, it's gonna be another 18 months, two years before I wanna exit, that individual has been identified and has already been de being developed so there's a shorter development plan or time frame. I'm curious around that's in a uh, almost planned situation. And yeah. the, the person in uh, who's currently steering the ship mm -hmm. saying, I don't want to steer it anymore. And mm -hmm. let's work and plan and, and look at that. What if there's a situation where um, I'm listening to this and I'm not at the top but I see maybe the people at the top are making decisions differently to what I think they should be. Mm -hmm. Maybe under this unique melting pot of pressures where we have to reimagine just about every business. Right. And I'm feeling that maybe that could cause the company harm. You know, mm -hmm. I'm seeing that other, oh, they're not seeing the writing on the wall. We're not innovating quick enough. We're not doing these things. Mm -hmm. How would you support somebody through um, being able to help a business survive when maybe the current leadership aren't aware they need to be succeeded, but if they aren't, it potentially puts the entire business at risk. And I right. could well imagine many businesses being in this situation right now right. Uh, where they're under such pressure and nobody's prepared for what we've just been through and going through. Right. And maybe those that have been there a long time are not able to adapt as quickly as others mm -hmm. might see that. How might you advise people in that sort of situation? Yeah, uh, I, I would advise them first to, to come up with some, some questions that would get those individuals that have been around for a while and, and not kind of seeing past this, this issue of, you know, impact, future impact, you know, what, what are we doing today that if, if we continue to do is not going to be beneficial? You know, those question. kind yeah. of coaching questions, really. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that you're, you're coaching up versus coaching down. And just, it, it's getting curious. And um, I, in fact, I recommend individuals to, to start with that statement. You know, I'm curious. What do you think about? How would you do X? What would you do next? It's, it's getting curious. And um, what are some of the things to be aware of? You know, uh, somebody who's been a coach who knows how to position it, how to frame it, and that that's uh, seen as a development, not as a point of, oh, uh, in the bad hands, in bad context, are you trying to prove that I'm not doing my job right or are you trying to catch me out versus, yeah. oh, I'm a coach and that's why I'm here and I'm wanting to develop with you. Right. Certainly somebody who isn't that, what are maybe a couple of the pitfalls of, what you've seen in your career of, you know, where organizations have done that well to prepare through these sort of periods of change. And that's really what you've been dealing with is helping them through change. Um, right. What are some of the yeah. tips that you could give? I, I think for, first of all, um, as an organization, it's how you set up kind of the, the coaching culture within your organization. There are, and I'm, I'm really um, hesitant to go into an organization where the only time they use coaching is to fix somebody. They've, they've tried everything and the last resort is let's, let's call Beth in or some other coach 
and she's going to be able to fix them. Well, I'm, I'm at that point. It's, it's a hospital to pass. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And it's, it's usually too late yeah. because um, that individual will, will already have a, a reputation in the organization that um, may, may have been hurt and um, be difficult to change perception by, by others. Whereas um, those organizations that embrace coaching as a development tool and um, one method of, of developing somebody is a much better culture as it, as it relates to coaching. So that people, when they hear coaching, they say, oh, this is a benefit. I, I get to have a coach. In fact, just before our, our conversation, I was having my, uh, my first coaching conversation with, with somebody in an organization that I've been supporting for the last five years. And they have, they definitely have that coaching culture where they have high potentials moving up in the organization and they want to give them some coaching to round them out. It's, it's not fixing them. It's enhancing them. Enhancing them. I'm interested. So inside organizations and the culture that you've been talking about there, many might be familiar with a culture that is a learning culture, a development yes. culture. You know, we have L and D departments right. within organizations. What's the difference between learning development training and coaching um, in the, in that context? Yeah. So, um, you know, learning is, is gathering information, new knowledge. Okay. Um, coaching is really about asking questions and challenging um, an individual's self-limiting beliefs and um, getting them to come to their own solution. The learning, um, what's important about learning is making sure that you are able to apply it. So it's, a, it's important that when somebody is going through training that um, they're going through it at a time when they can apply, apply it effectively. So if it's, um, if for instance, it's accountability, then what, what relationships do they have that they can then take the information that they've learned about creating an accountable interaction and putting it into place pretty quickly so that it's, it's building that new habit. So I guess it's in, in that context, it kind of a bit the glue between the learning and the doing, you know, between yeah. the thinking and the actual practical aspect and the outcome is the development of the new habit or the, the yes. result. Uh, yeah. So we, we have some outputs, but the outcome is that you've then leveled up. You've either upskilled or you've reskilled somebody in an area and the coaching plays the bit in, in, the, in the glue. Yeah. In fact, um, my coaching oftentimes includes a development plan that we've okay. identified. Uh, for instance, this, this individual that I was talking about, uh, we identified that delegation was going to be um, one skill that she needed to really improve on because her time management was, was poor and it really related to delegation. So mm -hmm. trying to get, get to the underlying cause um, and then once we start working on her homework and um, then there's coaching that reinforces or helps to shift any kind of techniques that, that we've agreed for her to, to try and getting her feedback from, from individuals. So it's a kind of, it's a, a blended method. method. Yeah. In terms of some of the then executive coaching work that you do, many are going to be faced with now completely new things they're having to do, you know, reskilling themselves, whether mm -hmm. that's underpinned from a technological shift or an environmental one of the industrial industry change. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the uh, methods that you, the, you use or an example in an organization where uh, the reskillings happened for executives that you could tell a story of that we can uh, learn from? So 
one of the biggest themes I have, have seen over these last several months, now that everybody really is, is not meeting face to face and uh, Zoom meetings have, have become prevalent, is that leaders have made a shift from being results focused first and then relationships follow to a, a flip flop where they realize that they need to make sure that their employees are okay, that there's a lot of anxiety and fear still. And, and so they have, they have started those meetings more as personal check-ins and they've, they've really gotten to understand their employees better because of that. My hope is that that continues um, that a year from now that will still be happening. I would, I would say maybe my experience has shown that maybe 20% of the people will, will stick with that. <laughs> the other 80% will go back to, okay, let's, you know, what's happening, where do we need to, to get results? Um, but, but it's been a great learning. One of, one of the things I often ask uh, leaders is, you know, what have you learned about yourself? during this process? What, what are those things that um, maybe have surprised you? And getting them to self-reflect. I've also encouraged them, some, some of them won't do it because it's just not their cup of tea, but to journal yep. and, and to, to reflect on, you know, what, what's working, what's not working. What have they learned about themselves? Um, how do they take care of themselves? That's another thing is they, so many of them are, are focused on helping their employees, but they're not helping themselves. And unless you as a leader are healthy, you can't help your employees to the, to the degree that, that you could if you were. I think that's really key. It's um, the analogy I use, you know, is when you're on an aircraft and they're giving you the advice you put your air mask on yourself first before others you need yep. to be healthy the same with yep. leaders is how are you feeding yourself to right. be healthy when yep. we're doing the self-reflection are we going down a dark path by looking at all the things on my big to-do list that i didn't do right. and beating myself up or am i finding the things that i did well am, right. am i looking through a positive lens or a negative and does that then spin off into my aura to others right um i love your um flip-flop of from results to relationships mm -hmm. and the need to prioritize relationships when we're at a distance and yeah. when we are in effect disconnected from many of the cues we get and we don't even realize we're getting them when we're physically with somebody we can sense things some people are really good at it that can right. sense all of those things, some less so and need to put in the, the habits and train themselves yeah. to be, be aware of that. In terms of some um, advice, you know, I feel super um, fatigued from Zoom, you know, a day for me can start, you know, very early in the morning till late in the evening because of different time zones, because it's now possible to Zoom anywhere. Um, exactly. yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden the expectation that we put on ourselves to, you know, Zoom is now a transportation network. It's not just <laughs> a communication network. It transports us to the same place. We're now in a same place somewhere in Cloudlandia, you know, yeah. that you've joined from Atlanta. I've joined from the UK yeah. and we're able to have a conversation. Um, preparing to, to deal with the relationship versus, versus the result. Mm -hmm. um, what would you advise people do when, equally, they feel under so much pressure to get a result, um, yeah. to put that first. How might they manage that? Yeah. I, I think part of it, and, and this is something that has come up quite a bit, uh, leaders who you say, yeah, okay, you know, I, I'm really concentrating on, on the relationship, but uh, I, I don't feel the confidence that some of these people are, are working as hard um, as if they were in the office. That's one of the things I hear. And it's, okay, are they getting the results that you're looking for? If they're, ge if they're getting the results that you're looking for, then you shouldn't, you're worrying about something you shouldn't be worried about. If, on the other hand, 
the results aren't coming, then, then it's a matter of creating accountability and, and metrics that will allow you to know that, you know, that they're doing what they need to be doing. So it's, it's digging down into, um, you know, the job description and profile and understanding what, what is success, success for that individual. So I've got a, um, a question for you here and, you know, the world is accelerating in requiring us to change on every front, change the way we think, the way we do work in a, both a positive and in some aspects uh, could be viewed as a negative way. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm seeing part of my team not embracing the speed of change that's required. So the difference between I have a great relationship, um, you know, I'm working with them, they care about what we're doing, but they're just not getting the results at the speed we need the results. Mm -hmm. uh, it might have been that they were getting results great when we were in a linear world, okay. whereas yeah. now this pressure of, of life and death, of speed, of being able to create value much quicker when mm -hmm. we're under pressure, how might I um, best approach that with my team? What, what would that uh, look like? What, you know, you see, you, I love already these great questions that you've shared, almost coaching questions to use, um, but how might we approach that situation if people are not changing quick enough and getting the results quick enough? Uh, they might have done slowly, but now it's about speed. Right. And I, uh, the, the first thing I would do is make sure they understand that speed is important. You know, if, if, if they're not being measured by that, that's a problem, right? Now, if they are being measured on that, then it's as a team, bring them together and, and maybe brainstorming on what, what can we, how can we change the process or tweak the process to make sure that we're, we're doing it quicker? What are, what are some of uh, some of the steps that may be not value added or um, steps that, that aren't going to be you know, productive. So it's a great opportunity to reimagine and remove a whole load of right. you know, process weight um, yeah, exactly. within and these things. So it could be positioned and framed in that way um, to release some of the shackles to allow people to do that. Um, Another kind of twist to that. What if I then um, am feeling that, but I don't think it's even possible as a leader that I'm almost feeling there's too higher expectation, um, that I know they're doing the best they can. Uh, we've removed all of that stuff, but I still feel fearful of uh, the environment, of my sector, of my you know business. Um, mm -hmm where else might they be able to go and what have you seen work really well? You mentioned about peer learning and about Vistage and those yeah. sorts of groups. Um, where might they, they look for help that uh, isn't maybe within their team, but is outside of that? Where would they start? You know, um, yeah, peer, peer groups are, are a great, great method, but I would also encourage, because Vistage will do this. You have, within a Vistage group, different industries. There, and that's, that's so that you, you've got a safe place to bring significant issues and you're not concerned about a competitor sitting, sitting next to you. It's important to be able to look broadly with across industries. So, you know, what can you be learning from other industries that could be valuable to your industry and to your company? So it's, it's really about making sure that you stay up to date with trends, not just in your, your industry, but others. So it's, you know, making sure that, that you read, that, yep. you know, you, I've got, I've got um, an inbox of articles that I'm constantly getting and I just, I will open it up and just quickly look at the, the titles say, okay, this one looks like something that I should, should delve into. And, and that's how I stay, stay abreast with, with what's going on. With what's going on. Yeah. I want to circle us back to one of the original 
um, threads around making ourselves replaceable. And that was very much under the lens of kind of succession and thinking of the leaders of small businesses. What about making myself uh, replaceable in my own task and career and role? So some of this is going to come along because of technical disruption. Yeah, you know, I may have a role that is in uh, telesales or customer service via, you know, big phone centers that mm-hmm. now chatbots, all of these things are coming along that are displacing um, a, a role. How might many individuals rethink and reimagine uh, the succession almost of themselves to leave their old identity and be able to create a new one for a new role? Um, what might they be able to learn from the examples you gave before of succession of, you know, almost a CEO or owner going to, oh, my current job, and I want to be a succession to my current identity and current job to my new one. What might we I, take away from that, that situation? I think that it's important that uh, individuals understand their strengths. What are those, those strengths that they bring that aren't specific skills and knowledge that can be transferred to other industries and other positions? So that's the first thing is understanding your, your core, your, your core strengths. And then it's, what is it that brings you joy? What brings you passion? Um, there, there are a number of people I know that have reinvented themselves two and three times because they have, they've learned more about themselves through the, the previous experience and understood you know, what were those things that really brought them joy and passion? What were those things that they didn't particularly like? And they've, they've reinvented themselves. So- um, I, I like that idea a lot. And uh, in my journey, speaking to people, this sort of pursuit of passion or to find something as if it's a, an X on a treasure map somewhere that when I get there, oh, that's it, to the other thought of, um, you know, you, you have a, uh, a big block of stone and actually all I'm doing all is taking away the other things to reveal the sculpture. It was always in there. So I'm right. discovering my passion rather than going and finding it. And I yeah. discover it by going and doing things, experience mm-hmm. them. Get, what have yeah. I done this week for the first time? What experiment right. have I done to, to say, do I want to do that again? Or do yeah. I want to not do that again? You know, yeah. and almost yeah. being back to what it was like when we were children. Mm-hmm. You know, when we were playful, when we were experiencing different things to say, is that something I want to repeat or I want to let go? And so that's something that, um, you know, I've, I've already taken away from our conversation is at those transition points to go and explore, to be yeah. curious, to try new things, to discover, because, you know, our passion evolves. Yes. Um, you know, and it gets yeah. nuances to it as we go mm-hmm. deeper down or as we see something else that we're inspired by. Yeah. In terms of um, to kind of wrap up with a few really practical tips of where um, the essential skills to survive in small businesses today mm-hmm. um, and how they might ensure that their teams have all the things that you've been talking about of great succession planning, a coaching culture, all of those things. What are two very practical tips that somebody could start doing today that will have an impact uh, for them? So one of the things is, is understanding how to hire great people that fit with your culture. I find that smaller companies, you know, they're, they're small. And every individual that you bring on is, is important and is an important um, puzzle piece to your operations and, and success. And what I find is that um, a lot of these small businesses are focused on the resumes and the, the skills and the experience and not focused on how that individual is going to fit in their organization. I, I use the analogy of the palm tree. The palm tree is, will thrive in Florida, 
But if you pick it up and transplant it in Alaska, it's, it's going to die. It was, it was great in Florida, but not so much in, in Alaska. And that happens a lot where there's been somebody that's been very successful in one company, but they've wound up in an environment that, that doesn't motivate and engage them. So that to me would be one thing is really, really figuring out how to hire the right people that fit your, your culture and your values. Um, I think the, the second one is accountability and accountable interactions. Oftentimes, when, especially in smaller companies, you're running rapidly and you communicate quickly. You don't slow down and ask the individual to say back to, to you what they heard, kind of echo back. And what happens is that person thinks they heard what you said, but didn't and goes down the wrong path and loses time and productivity. And you find out a couple days later that they didn't do exactly what you thought you had told them. So asking them to echo back what, what they heard and then that gives you time in the moment to self direct. And that, that to me is huge. It's, it's slowing down. As, slow down as, to speed up, you yeah, know, in, exactly. in effect. And exactly. that, I, that's a really great point and great tip to just, uh, you know, we're at such pace. We're communicating, yes. we're going on next Zoom, next bit, to just build in time to say, um, reflect back. What, yeah. what did you understand from that? What are the action points and things that you're going to be doing and taking away from this so yeah. that we can make sure before it closes off and before it's too late that they've wasted days or weeks going down what they thought they heard. Exactly. That's a great one. And the other one I've, I've, you know, for years had this challenge around when you bring talent in and being able to see beyond the label that's on the forehead that says, I'm going to be great fit for your culture, that when you get them in, you go, oh, no, I've just brought a palm tree to my Alaska base, right. but uh, they looked like, you know, something right. else. Um, how can you uh, mitigate against the unknown of the culture fit? We can do all the best we can. We can have the interviews, we can, you know, communicate with them, we take up references, and we can get a sense and feel for how they've been before. Mm -hmm. And we're then taking a guess, right, that they're going to thrive in this new environment. Right. And we can mitigate some of those things and say, okay, might not be Florida, but it's another sunny place. And the soil has got these same nutrients and all of these things. And so we go, okay, yeah, I think the palm tree is going to exist because it's come from a small company to a small company or from this role to this role. Right. Um, but I've still got it wrong. You know, I've got it wrong many times where I thought, oh, this is going to be a great culture fit. Uh, there's loads of things that are there and it just doesn't work out. And I'd love to be able to find a way in which that that um, happens and it's still seen as a very positive rather than it's seen as, oh, got it wrong to a, hmm. okay, we, we had in this motion this, I don't know what it is, you know, and, and the only thing that I've seen is just, oh, it's a three month probation, you know, on, on either side uh, of to figure right. out, does it fit? Right. Is yeah. there a better way or something else? Well, I mean, that that, to, to help? Yeah. I mean, that's one way. Uh, the other is uh, there are a lot of companies that don't use assessments and assessments can, can un uncover natural behaviors that um, were were built between zero and three years old. And those are generally those go-to behaviors when you're under stress. And stress is what will cause bad behavior. So if, if you have an understanding of, of what their natural tendencies are, that doesn't mean that they operate that way all the time because they've mm -hmm. had experience and figured out that they, they need to adjust. But you can then build some questions around 
those natural go-tos that may be a misfit yep. with, with your, your culture and, and organization. So get help to see the invisible right. um, in terms of some of those innate, uh, you know, way people operate, the way right. they solve challenges, the yeah. way they face things under stress is yeah. going to be super valuable uh, yeah. as insights. And just make sure that, that the assessment is um, validated for hiring because there are a lot of assessments out there that, that aren't. Yeah. And the same in terms of uh, for development, you know, yes. uh, yeah. within development, seeing is someone fit for this, you know, uh, transition for the next bit to take on the next role as, oh, they've yeah. been in there, they've done it, they've done a great job. But right. do they have now what it takes? Where's the gap and what are we putting in place in order for them to thrive? Because we're, we're picking that palm tree up and we're now going to put them in the block of flats uh, on the third floor. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And yeah. so it's equally important internally as bringing in brand new talent when you're that's, transferring. Yeah, that's a, uh, a major mistake I see with smaller companies. And that is they get confused between performance and potential. And um, they think, hey, a high performer, somebody who's really good at, you know, graphical design is super good at it. Well, gee, you know what? We've got an opening for um, a manager in graphical design. Let's put Joe in that position. They're two entirely different skill sets. And, you know, they, they oftentimes will give. In fact, I was just talking to this, this woman um, at, at my client's site earlier today, and she was talking about how this one woman who she was on her team when she was, was promoted, she was given a lead position and she three years ago said, I don't want this, but they gave it to her anyways. And so now this woman is dealing with a performance issue through no, you know, I mean, this woman, didn't want it to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Yeah, we do. I, I've certainly been guilty of this uh, challenge of potential versus performance. Um, and, you know, we, we innately reward high performance and we think it's uh, often in a way in which it's uh, not wanted, you know, uh, right. to manage people versus I just want to master this area that I'm, you know, delivering value in and I want to just get better and better at that. Um, and so that's a, a great takeaway and great point. If, if any of our listeners, uh, you know, have been inspired and, and have reimagined and rethought about maybe they've had some learning, got development in their organization, but as a result of listening to this, now are thinking, ah, we could unlock that and um, maximize it through some coaching. Uh, they might not have explored coaching before and they perhaps want to reach out to you. How would they get in touch with you? Uh, what's the best way of, of, of doing that, Beth? Um, two ways. One is through my website, which is executive-velocity.com. And um, on that, I also have a resource page that's got a lot of, of free resources that they can download uh, related to hiring and, and leadership development. Uh, then um, there's LinkedIn. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. It's the easiest way to find me is also use my maiden name, which is Arm Connect. It's A-R-M-K-N-E-C-H-T. So it's Beth Arm Connect Miller. I'm the only one there. So that'll be the easiest, easiest way to reach out to me. That's fantastic. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, I certainly have got some value from our conversation and I appreciate your time, Beth. It's been uh, really joyful. Well, I enjoyed it as well, Ross. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have the level of adaptability to survive and thrive the rapid changes ahead? Has your resilience got more comeback than a yo-yo? Do you have the ability to unlearn in order to reskill, upskill and break through? Find out today and uncover your adaptability profile and score, your AQ. Visit aqai.io to gain your personalized report across 15 scientifically validated dimensions of adaptability. For a limited time, enter code PODCAST65 for a complimentary AQME assessment. AQAI. 
transforming the way people, teams and organisations navigate change. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favourite podcast directory and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.